So um, welcome everybody back here to the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in New York, Manhattan, and welcome to our viewers on HowlRound. Um, we uh, screened or streamed over the time of Corona almost all our discussions and panels are online. And um, so, um, so I think also the big part of the audience uh, is with us. So thank you from wherever you are watching and everybody here um, in the um, audience. Um, thank you for taking out the time um, to listen to um, what we think is a very significant, important um, a, a, a connection of work. Uh, Milo Rao is here with us uh, from the NT Gent, formerly now with the Vienna Festwochen. And Kristen is here with us, Marcia and Dunyon. So thank you all for coming. And as you can see here, it is called Beyond the 2% a Manifesto, Raising the Bar for Women, women Ex-Composers, and um, is a global composer platform. And it's part of what we talked about earlier that when Milo uh, he does engage in something, he wants to leave something, he wants to create something. And um, so today um, we will talk about um, um, what was a shocking discovery you made that inspired you to do this. But in, to start, maybe uh, Kristen, we start with you and say who you are very briefly, what you're doing and how you are um, connected to. Hi, I'm Kristen Martin. I'm the founding artistic director of Here Art Center and a co-founding director of the Prototype Festival, which is an annual festival of opera and music theater here in New York City. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'll pass. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marcia Sells. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the chief diversity officer for the Metropolitan Opera and assistant general manager for employee engagement, community engagement, government relations. Um, I've now been there three years, and it's been an amazing um, opportunity um, to see an art form that I really care about, think about how it's going to continue. Uh, Milo Rao, uh, artistic director from the Vienna Festival, he, his, and I'm here to listen to, uh, I don't know, we have a festival, an institution, and a composer, so to listen to the American experience of, let's say, music <laughs> and music institution. And I'm, I'm Duyun, I am a composer and performer. Yeah, I'm Frank Henschke, who runs the Siegel Center here. Um, Tanya Leon uh, is not joining us uh, tonight. Um, perhaps uh, something in the communication didn't go right, perhaps on our side, so uh, we apologize if, um, for this. Um, if you are tuning in also to hear from here, she's a great composer, actually also a member of the faculty or former of the Graduate Center CUNY here and really a brilliant, brilliant mind. Before we come to you, Milo, uh, tell us a little bit why you said, I would like to do this uh, uh, panel. Why is that important? And uh, tell us about the 2%. Yeah, perhaps a very small background on this uh, idea and why the, uh, this is called Academy Zweite Moderne, Academy Second Modernism. So I said Vienna Festival and uh, it's 150 years of Schönberg, so the creator of uh, atonale Zwölfton Musik, etc. So a bit the hero of modernism. And at one point we said, but this modernism is incomplete. It was very European, it was very uh, male, and it was, uh, of course, super elitist. And then Jana Beckmann, who is in the public, uh, the music dramaturg of the festival, had the idea to make this academy. And uh, so the academy is based on a, on a very uh, simple arithmetical uh, fact that Arnold Schönberg, he had a lot of students that are very known today, John Cage, you wouldn't know, uh, Hans Eisler, you wouldn't know, Alban Berg, of course, you wouldn't know. But he also had 50 uh, female students, uh, around 50. Yeah? And because this festival is running for five years, so the, 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 the period we will be there, perhaps 10, but for the moment for five. So we said every year we would invite 10 composers make an open call and invite 10 composers from all continents or different continents and different ways of conceiving music and composing music, uh, all female, uh, to, this, uh, to this academy. And uh, the first call was sent out. I think we had like 150 applications from 49 countries, something like that. And uh, we are very happy to have you in the academy, of course and uh, nine other uh, people. So this is the first year, and the, there will be the first uh, meeting of this academy in Vienna in June, uh, to then produce work, to connect people, and to 
connect other institutions. So we have with a lot of institutions or several institutions in Europe, and of course now also in New York, yesterday the Carnegie Hall, for example, we have discussions to see how can we connect? How can we, maybe for example, say, okay, let's let's make a, a project together with you. How can we bring in this opera house in this country and this country to raise, and now we come to the 2%. When you look, it's between two and seven, so that depends a bit from the survey. Um, and this, this, this number didn't change in the last hundred years. So historically, it always was more or less this, that of all the composers in concert halls, in opera houses, only two to 7% are female. From the composers represented uh, in, in, in our big institutions worldwide. So in Germany, it's, or German speaking countries, it's only 2%. Uh, in other countries, it's 7% or perhaps it's 10, but we are talking about a percentage that is lower than in any other field um, of the arts, I think, and of society and of, of everything. And I was asking myself, of course, there is the dead composers, so you have a lot of Wagner and Mahler and so on and so on and so on. So it was a culture that was based on, on a European male, etc., etc. you know that. But it didn't change so much in the last hundred years, so we were asking ourselves why. And, uh, and we want to collect in this first year, we want to start to produce, but also collect experience, institutional experience, how to change it, and perhaps also how to understand why is it as it is from different perspectives of uh, of the field so that's the that's the let's say the basis of this of this panel and of course when jana and you you, you started to invite uh, people of course we searched for uh, kind of different approaches to the field and uh, that's why we are here great so maybe before we come to uh, marcia um, do you tell us a little bit how did that uh, how did you connect to it what do you think of that platform. Oh, I need to yet to need to to understand how that platform will um, pan out. Um, but I think that's that um, um, you know, I think I'm I too am shocked by the number. Um, I think sometimes as a working artist, you don't think about those numbers. You just do your work. Um, but if you are a curator and a programmer, and I worked uh, with um, Kristen. Um, um, the prototype festival, and 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 I can have her t tell you more about um, the artist that the prototype has been historically represent, which I think m most of them are women artists. So when we are looking at numbers and the statistics, you know, um, Milo, you were talking about about the, the the big organizations, the major institutions, right? But as a working artist, you don't really put a lot of differences between the big institutions and the and and a fledge and 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 no walls. Uh, you just really focus on on the on the works. But I was very struck by what you said yesterday morning um, about we have to start somewhere and and understand how the statistics work. And I think that is we need to even though the number is kind of embarrassing, um, but I think that at least we are doing something and and and. And I know all of the other nine composers, so I know it's already going to be awesome. What you are going to do? Oh, um, hopefully. Um, um, so uh, w we're going to repre represent um, this work uh, with a, a collaboration work of mine with um, Palestinian uh, filmmaker and, and visual artist. Um, Haleda Girard, and the title of the piece is called Where We Lost Our Shadows, and it's based on human migrations. And we come to it later. Um, Marcia, um, I don't know if you were here earlier, but we talked about institutions, working in institutions, and Milo said we have to go inside to be part of it and change it, and to enforce what's good and change what's not working. Um, tell us a bit about your work. I was not aware of your position. Tell us a little bit. And I gather some of how I got here is because of my relationship with Tanya Leone, who was the director of music for the Dance Theater of Harlem, where I was a dancer. That's how I came to New York City in the 70s. So um, I'm not a composer, but I come to this art form through ballet. Um, so one of the, and part of 
because of that experience, I care very deeply about the classical art form. So when this position opened up, when you say about coming inside, I have, most people who know my work, I've traditionally been more of a institution person, but it also means because you understand how they're built, how they're structured, what some of their goals are, you can also think about what are the ways you might disrupt some of the things that are happening in those spaces um, that are not, that sometimes have been exclusionary. So it was great to see that the Metropolitan Opera, when I saw the application for the role, was absolutely committed to this idea of bringing in a chief diversity officer at the highest level in terms of reporting directly to Peter Gelb, who's the general manager, and then working with um, seven other assistant general managers who work in different aspects of the organization so that you can look at all aspects of the organization from what's happening in our in the actual things that we're putting on our stages, what's happening with the people who are hired and brought in to both work as arts administrators to the people who are actually from building sets to building costumes and thinking of design for makeup artists to lighting design, um, as well as what happens and, and how do you do auditions? How, how do you ha have these kinds of con conversations and making sure that you're bringing in a range of artists? So it was wonderful that they started it and, I mean, in terms of had the position, but also we're thinking way ahead because uh, for those of you indeed who know opera and particularly more traditional opera companies, you know, planning four or five years in advance, there were already these kinds of conversations about what are those works that we're going to put on the stages and who do we need to do those works? Because to your point, the earlier composers, mostly all white European men and dead, how do you then translate a new, not only in terms of new stories, but how do you really translate in terms of music or in terms of ideas, new work? So look to the future. The Met um, had a collaboration with Lincoln Center for new composers, and the three composers are um, all of color, but two are women. And it was absolutely clear, Jesse Montgomery and Valerie Coleman, um, so now it's also for them in terms of creating those works, as well as had on our plate and conversations with Terrence Blanchard and opera companies, smaller opera companies that have already been doing some of that experimental work, but how do we reach out and work with them? We were also just talking about Yuval Sharon, um, who collaborated with the Met to bring X Life and Times of Malcolm X by Anthony Davis. We're going to be doing, you know, so part of my job is to get excited and to bring people in, but also to talk to the company. Like, where where are we having these kinds of conversations? How are we bringing in these new works? And how are we bringing in the new audiences? Because the other reality for this art form, meaning and not just opera, it's happening in, quote, ballet, symphony orchestras. The generation of people who used to go or had traditionally been going, this is, this isn't to be mean or cruel. It is just, it is sadly math, unless we find the fountain of youth, our audience is dying. So how do you, in a realistic way, fill the seats? You can't, you know, you don't want to literally see it just empty out if you really care about it. As somebody said to me, change is hard, extinction is probably harder. So we don't want it to be extinct we want the art form real because it has things to say so we've been doing those so between who are you putting on the stages and what that is to how do you bring in the new audience and get them excited um, and in, in it can also be in terms of looking at the ticket prices but even before we began looking at ticket prices we started looking at organizations that have what we call employee resource groups or affinity groups and many of those and these are young men, women, non-binary who um, have gone to business school or law school or um, finance backgrounds working in big companies that pay very nice salaries that can afford the price of the tickets we have now. We have done a number of these over the last three years and discovered that some of these groups we bring in 
Latinx, African American, um, even LGBTQ, many have not come to the opera before. They have never come to the Met. They know the building. They know Lincoln Center. One per and one person told us. I mean, and they can. They're making you know six figure salaries. I just didn't think it was for me. I didn't think, you know, it didn't speak to me. But now that I've been here, this is great. So we're doing that to build that new audience, as well as one person said, I thought it was only for rich white people, so it just, I would just stay away. Which I to say, I will say, was a sad thing, because I started in ballet in 1964, and my mother used to take me to the symphony in Cincinnati, Ohio, a wonderful symphony orchestra, love music hall. And I always thought of that as my place. I mean, I know that I would go and there were not very many people who looked like me there. But I thought, how do we get from just 1964 within my lifetime to 2024 and we still have a generation of people who think this is not for me. So that's, I will say for me, one of the biggest missions of my job to let people know these places are for you, they're yours, keep speak to it. As my mother said, once you buy the ticket, they can't tell you to leave or they shouldn't. <laughs> Thank you. Kristen, um, you're not as old as the 100 years or more of the Metropolitan Opera. You also don't have to work five, five years ahead. I don't know how far you do. Tell us a bit about your, the idea of your prototype. Uh, how has it been, the experience? Yeah, um, Beth Morrison and I started Prototype along with Kim Whitener, uh, Beth's company, Beth Morrison Projects, and Kim at that time was with me at Here Art Center. The three of us were hatching a plot about how to have the composers that we felt really passionate about seen and heard. Um, we felt like they were, they were making this work that was in unconventional spaces, classical contemporary work that wasn't being seen, and we wanted this work to expand beyond the bars and the nightclubs and the small black boxes where the work was starting and to be placed into other contexts where it could have a life beyond that. And I think it's speaking a lot to what you're talking about, about having an interest in opera and music theater and about interrogating the line between those things and why some people think opera's not for them and music is or music is for them and opera's not, like, you know, there are people, and in our festival, a goal is to, like, have people see that work in the same conversation and to think differently about what they're seeing. So that was a big part of what we were interested in. Um, we knew a lot of fierce women that we thought would be great. Um, since the festival started 12 years ago, um, we've produced and presented 84 works. Um, 59% of those have been by women artists, women-led projects. Um, and the majority of that 59% is women composers. Uh, 51 or 52% has been BIPOC-led projects. So um, a lot of people are saying that the work is not out there, but the work is out there. People just aren't producing it. And of the work that we've done, 26 were world premieres. So we're really trying to change the canon and have the canon include a much broader spectrum of definition. And we're thinking a lot about how there's music that people haven't heard. We've had stuff from, uh, I think it's uh, 16 or 17 countries um, in our festival and thinking about what it is that we think of when we think of music and how we can expand that definition and understanding. And that's part of what we're super interested in as well. So um, that's, that, that was the premise of why we started. And then we've, ex we've, we've changed curatorially over the years and we were thrilled to have Du Yun with us this year and she'll be back with us next year as a, a guest composer. Du Yun's world premiere, Angel's Bone, we did, um, gosh, it's seven. Guest curator. <laughs> right. Guest curator. What okay. did I say? Guest composer, not Oh yeah, composer. guest curator, <laughs> yes. Yes, as guest curator with us this year and, and next year. But, but we had Angel's Bone six or seven years ago. Um, and that was, you know, th the work that we do is in quite small spaces and quite large spaces. And that's also part of what we're trying to play with, that you see an artist that might, you might usually see in an 800 seat house and a 70 seat house. And then you also see an artist that has never been in such a uh, context in an 800 seat theater. So we're really playing with those dynamics as well and valuing all the projects equally despite the size of the house or the scale of the artist's experience. So. How has the experience been 
do audience come? Do also the audience you want? Yeah, I I think that uh, I'll say like I've run um, here Art Center since 1993, and the here audience is uh, younger than the prototype audience, but the prototype audience is younger than a lot of opera going audiences. Um, so <laughs> the here audience, we used to say they're 20s, 30s. Now I'd say they're more 20s, 30s, 40s. But um, the prototype audience is, is is going from their 20s up to their 70s and 80s. I'd say, um, and and it's a spectrum. And and the, but the people are from all five boroughs, there are people who come in from around the country and the world to the festival now um, because there's there's an excitement about this contemporary work. Um, so that's been really great to see the growing audience coming from other cities as well to check out what we're doing. Um, yeah. it's, it's interesting when you say that we've been also now doing the numbers recently as we're putting on these new works and also uh, even the revivals of, of older works with new spins like our Lucia and our recent Carmen and we are actually seeing the numbers in terms of the ages of our audience also move down towards the mid 40s which is huge um, because it had been up towards the mid the, the sort of aging 50s and 60s so it's important that we now know that there is an audience for this work who are interested um and and you have to at least just get them in the first and that's and 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 learning from like definitely learning from organizations that have been doing this for a while and i think the things that you've added like the malcolm x reading that you guys did oh, that, that was so amazing and so many amazing performers participating in that as another entry point that people could come for free into the met and experience that is like another way that you, I think and, and people great. had never, yeah. there were people who had not come to the Met before. Again, it was that same, is this for me? I will say with that, even with the reading, it wasn't only the audience. We had staff members who'd been working at the Met. And we have a, we do have a diverse staff. Um, I think that surprises some people, but, and there are people who've worked there for a long time. There were people who wept because they had not thought the Met really understood them in terms, of, but when we did this reading of Malcolm X, they were like, "Okay, this is this is real. You 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 get it. You're thinking about how we do it, and that is that is also part of the work too." Um, the two percent is a real number. I think it was 2020 in Germany. Unfortunately, even uh, shockingly enough. Um, we talked about Milo's book this afternoon um, about you reclaiming the future, and he talks about, you know, the, the false labels, and he talks about, you know, old racism and new racism, the old racism. You were racist. You know, you made racist comments. You made jokes about the people you explored. The new racism, he says, is, you know, you go to a sensitivity seminar, and uh, you don't say whatever the N-word, but nothing has changed. It's still the same, the inside. So it's a incredible question you ask and you are all confronted with. How can it be that 98%, which means 98 of 100 people, you know, are men there, only two of them are women, and how can that be cracked? I mean, how, how is it even ha possible? And then what can be done, should be done? Well, there are people who are intentionally planning their programming recognize, if not thinking about that particular data point, but actually intentionally planning the program. So, you know, our music director, Yannick Nizetz, again, has been programming and thinking about work, not just of living com women composers, but, you know, he's done a number two with um, 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 Ms. Price, who, as a composer of color, actually had the opportunity to have her first work, Florence Price having her first work, um, with the Chicago Symphony, but then it sort of went away. But when you have to plan intentionally for, and the, you know, having um, more operas by women composers, you know, Jean Tesori will be the opening, her work Grounded will be the opening opera for the Mets um, season 24-25, um, and working with composers like Missy Mazzoli, having composing programs that are putting a pipeline. I mean, part of it is not just looking at the data point, but then intentionally planning your program. Like, you intentionally plan, here's what we're gonna do. We recognize that there are these 
women and people of color who have not had their work, here's what we're going to do. That's, I mean, I know it, I don't mean it to sound simplistic, but it really has to be a mindset that this is what you're going to do. How how is your experience inside the institutions? Are the doors open, or you run into openness, or is it? complex i know you're on a panel but still how is the work for you in real life it is, i mean it is complex i mean i don't think anybody who takes on this work and i will say as a person who is quote physically the embodiment of diversity and having a job with this kind of title not not the chief diversity part i mean assistant general manager part because that didn't exist before people weren't thinking about it so if the door is open through the, the, the chief diversity officer role, but then you also have the both experience and capacity to look across the organization and the things that it's doing, um, that's, that's a huge opportunity. Um, and the organization had to say, yes, we're going to do that. And I don't see that I will be the only one in the, and definitely my hope and plan for the work that I do is that I'm not the last one, that there will be people behind me and that we're training them and having them understand both the institution and then there are things that change. I mean, as you mentioned, the Met is over 138 years old. Its premise at one particular point was for two different warring factions of wealthy people to show off their wealth. That has changed considerably because as I said, that demographic is beginning to shift. And even for that demographic, their progeny aren't, may not always be interested. So they die, the money goes to where? You still have to interest this, this other group. So um, I do, the work is hard. It, sh it shifts, but not impossible. And if somebody doesn't come inside and doesn't raise these ideas and we just let these institutions fall, maybe, maybe Hopefully something else comes up behind it if that's the case. But if what you want is for the art form to survive, then you have to figure out how you change. Milo, what do you do different than the director of the Vienna Festival from before? What in context to the 2%? Yeah, I think uh, just that we that we would create these this, this platforms different that we think institution i mean you you described it very well for the for the for the met opera because it's uh, that you use an institution to uh, change the way how you produce art and how you produce audience because what i know from opera for example in the opera of geneva i did two operas as a director one was mozart the other one was a living composer from uh, catalonia hector para and uh, in the audience existing in Geneva, in this Grand Theatre de Genève, which is a big opera in Europe, um, for Mozart, you can de deconstruct how you want. You can completely destroy it, but you can play it 20 times, you know, because it's Mozart. And Hector Parra, I mean, I did a quite classical staging and so on and so on. You can do it four times, five times. So the main problem as a composer is that you are alive, you know? So I think you have to change this first and you have to change i think the audience that that you bring the people that would be interested in malcolm x or in hector para or in these kind of things in your work uh, to these institutions that they understand that these institutions are for them and i mean i'm quite new in the vienna festival and it's it's uh, it, my, my experience is mostly from from the theater i was before in Entegent in belgium and what interested me a lot that when we said, okay, we bring from the smaller spaces, the smaller stages to the big stage, the experimental project, the project that you would say, okay, it's a bit kind of a peripheric project to the center, we found the public without any problem. We found out that the public was waiting for these kind of things, that they came and came and came. So you can really unlearn an institution what <laughs> it did before and an institution can learn quite fast and of course the public that is linked often to the institution not even to this or that work they go there and they are interested in what happens in uh, vienna festival uh, the vienna festival is, a, is quite nice uh, example of it so it's 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 in the crossover field of, of europe it's the biggest festival we have and it's uh, a festival that people would go and buy tickets just because it's in the festival, you know? 
I mean, it might be a bit the same in your festival. And this is super beautiful. So you can then start to make a mix and to, in a positive sense, to educate people that they fall in love for your work or for somebody else from the, from the academy. And uh, perhaps in the years before, they were only uh, watching Mozart. So I think this is, uh, this is quite simple. And the last thing is what I found out, and, and I, I, I don't have so much institutional experience, but I was always uh, impressed because they always, for example, to me, they said, Amilo, ah, now you go to Vienna a Festival, and of course, this is super conservative and you will be destroyed. And um, I mean, in, in short, you know, they, they say it in a nicer way. And uh, and <laughs> I, I I was impressed how how uh, in in a very positive way and how flexible and how how weak these institutions are and how open in the end of the day these institutions are. So I mean it, it's a very positive for me a very positive experience because you think you have to fight it you have to destroy it you have to deconstruct it you know a bit like you know it from the institutional critique from I don't know the 60s that there is all these old people and they try to destroy you. But it's not like this. It's really I didn't find these 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 people there, and it's it's uh, uh, this is th I think it's a good. M I don't know how you. Uh, I mean, Matt is really uh, has a long tradition, uh, and and the Vienna Festival is is younger, um, but still, and 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 I think um, I I yeah I think it's a very good moment to do what in different ways we 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 try to do it's a very good moment in our civilization of course demographically it's a good moment of course concerning the interest of the public it's a good moment and uh, and 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 the same thing is for me i, I end with it uh, but of course we were talking about this kind of public that was never going to opera before i became a director for opera i was never going to opera because the seats are too expensive and i said I thought, oh, it's super boring, and I don't even have the clothes to go there. So it was, it was even for me, who comes really from the European middle class, who is kind of the cliche of the, of the guy who would go to the opera, it was just completely out of reach. And when I invited my, my mother uh, to, to see the Hector Parra uh, opera, she was like, like, I would invite her to something completely horrific and super boring. Uh, I, I, and I I and then I sent her a little piece of the music and it, it's a bit like film music somehow. And then she was saying, Ah oh, wow, okay, okay. I, I check it out and then and then she came and, and, and she liked it a lot. And uh, voila. So I mean that's that's it. So you're gonna show each year or present each year ten female composers for the next five years. So like fifty works? Yeah, I mean, yeah, concept. Jana's concept or um, yeah, I mean, it's it's too too big. Uh, it's together with the Klangforum. We 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 play the the compositions, in uh, which is a uh, very nice. Uh, perhaps in Europe the best. Uh, the uh, uh, how to say uh, 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 group of musicians playing modern music. So we do it together with them. We stream it with the with the first Austrian television. So we really try to 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 make it. To bring it to to hundred thousands of people, to, to, say, to really, it's not for we do it. Of course, in a it's a bit like your concept here. Of course, there will be hundred people present or hundred fifty. I don't know, but it's for a lot of people. So we try to make it popular, and we try to then produce one or two or several. I, I, I mean, what will be possible with the partner institutions? But inside the festival, every year at least two in the year after. So let's say twenty four, we have you as a guest. And we discuss and we see a piece of, of you, but then in the year after to produce uh, a real work and to have it in the festival, um, and 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 this is the plan. And of course, when when I when we sit here together or we sit together, of course, uh, it's it's uh, it's the ideas that then we would think, ah, okay, you already worked with her, so we could perhaps do this work together, and you could bring it to New York, and we could, you know. And then we meet somebody from Milano, I don't know, and they would bring it there. And we are together with Deutsche Oper and so on. And then we, we link people and institutions and, uh, and, 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 and try. Because for me, the, the, the last thing that I was a bit confused when I saw, when we did this Hector Perrin opera last or two weeks ago, that the Opera of Geneva was investing, I don't know how much money, perhaps two millions. 
to show it four times. And then it goes two times to a festival and they show it six times and then most probably it dies. And it's not the Ghent Manifesto, right? <laughs> I oh, not at all. It's, it's a complete, it's complete against all rules of popularizing art, no? It's like you would really bury it. And you see the whole institution thinking of they go to a burial, they show it. But it's, it's at the same time, you feel that it's dying while living. It's very strange. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <clears throat> so, um, do you how, tell us a bit, you're the artist also on the panel. How was your life experience? How was it for you? Dying while living. <laughs> to, create, to create your work. Um, <laughs> Um, if if in 98 of the places were occupied by somebody else, how, how was that for you and your friends and your community, your composer? How, how did you experience it? Of this great uh, divide, this unjust. Uh, well, I want to, can I, like, sure, uh, sure. in addition to the internet intentional planning, I really wanted to add one thing, um, or maybe two things, three things. Um, uh, one thing I, re I really think that, you know, that there are so many talks um, um, within institutions and be small or um, big, they would uh, look at artists as not just as a name, but not only as a number, and that's the worst, as a number, right? But sometimes um, the, the, the artist's name or the style come with a actually a baggage. And they would often say, okay, you know, uh, he or she or they or pronouns um, uh, are not ready for our audience or not ready for our call. So once someone's um, voice is too small for our stage or too, no, 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 this one does too much noise and electronic, you know, like, and for instance, and I think that, s and and if you wanted to, or uh, programming and, and, and championing women, not only women, but BIPOC, transgender, like all that, um, we really need to, as a curator, as an artist director, I think that we need to also think about the creative producing um, part of it, not just intentional planning, because you cannot just put work into your hall or on your stage. You have to really work with this, the, the artist and reimagining together. And I think that is so important to not have the fear to say that this one is not ready for, for us. Because that's, I think, the part of the job of, as a curator, as artist director, is to make it ready, right? Like as an artist, to make it ready, to make it however ready, however flexible it is. Because I think as an artist myself, I make sure that my work is ready to, 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 to talk about the content that I wanted to talk about. And then whatever that format that needs to be, we will, we will work it out together, right? Like I think that should be a little bit of a format that we need to rethink um, um, and uh, reimagine. And the other thing that I wanted to say about, about this is so great to have those initiatives and, and all that, you know, but I would hate to, to, to encounter this again and again, like every, every festival wake up to a phenomenon <laughs> this year and then the other year, you know, like a Don Ashken festival wants to do this global thing and they do the thing and then the new director comes in, they wanted to do another new thing. And and what happens is that the artists of people who want, you, you know, you want to chairman just feels like they're being dragged along, right? And I think that what the success of this kind of initiatives and a platform is should be based on ro profoundly rooted on um, continuum. It has to be on continuum and sustainability. What does that mean? Is that the world premiere productions needs to go out. Not only does it need to go out, we also need to look at new works from the artists. And I feel like Fortaba has been very successful uh, um, doing that. And I think it's, um, in the countries like Germany, because I have worked in Germany, <laughs> they it's always lost so many talk of like, oh, but not person you know serious or can can that person write music like it's just 
so much of that kind of you know oh, but like oh but but that is like oh you know there's the 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 major subscription thing and then there's the other frou frou shoulder pad <laughs> uh, anyway so that was the the, the <laughs> that was the like i would say uh, uh not only my frustration as a working artist because as a working artist i don't feel like i have that um but um as artist who trying to also work within our community at large, um, at globally. And I see that again and again and again, not just as women, not just as a BIPOC, like as everyone embodying that and, and also traditions and also music traditions, practices, not just that kind of style. So there are so many things that I would like to address. And I think of course, like, yeah, we can still talk about that number, but if we were talking about someone who is outside doing the operatic work and and all that things maybe it's it's zero point zero 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 point but it's not about number it's about like what kind of story we wanted to move forward in for our future generation i'm interested in the, con the the current storytelling is our current mind i don't care about two percent i don't care about a second i love schoenberg but when I was reading, you know, when I was studying those um, a textbook, you you just think because none of them is part of me, and you really think that has nothing to do with you, even though you love their music, you love the so you, I don't think I'm part of any of the percentage, but that's not, but it's okay, and I I think as an artist, it's, it's maybe it's okay because I'm interested in doing other things that is not. Um, that Schoenberg is interested in. And I think that is another something that we need to talk about as well. Like, great, heritage is fantastic. Um, and I write like Schoenberg too, and I can definitely use his set theory and all that. Um, but but I think I'm just maybe a little bit allergic to 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 when we are just like pitching hole to the to the numbers and and because what I'm caring for, is not from Schoenberg, right? Even though I he is one of my music idols, but I don't I, I don't come from that tradition. So yeah. so that's one I, of I hear you. So in a way you say I'm not even part of the two percent, which is even sadder, but also to say I don't want to be invited to the table. I would like to choose the evening. Let's go to the market. What are we gonna serve? What are we going to cook? What are we going to you want to you know, be part of the um, of the whole institution is that is that thinkable yeah yeah i mean in terms of the conversation about what it really means i mean as i've said the the um i forget who absolutely coined the phrase um, uh, but the idea of you know what's true inclusion to your point it's not just getting the invitation but did you get to participate in the shaping of the party and the and what music and who, who what the dancers are going to look like to your point i mean because the Metropolitan Opera is a large opera house, it's also, you know, 15 different unions, lots of, I mean, it, lots of structure too, and it costs a lot to, to even start a rehearsal for something on the stage. So you, to your point, you know, making sure that the work is ready, but it doesn't mean, oh, we won't consider that work because we haven't, um, it, you know, it, it doesn't fit. A lot of why it takes those five years is the beginning of the conversation, if not, you know, with collaborating opera houses that are smaller or organizations that um, have worked with particular composers before to think about how do we move that piece from Opera St. Louis, you know, the Opera Company of St. Louis, where Champion and um, Fire Shop in My Bones first came from. Those are very small stages, you know, like to a 3,000 plus opera house with all of the, the range of people that you have to have in order to fill it. That's part of the, your, to your point, that is also intentional. How do you bring someone along to bring that work forward? And I think that those are things that the Met, um, also in recognizing bringing new work and not and and even things that might be experimental, making sure that you bring it so that it doesn't have the one time performance. I mean, Fire Shop My Bones sold out and we're bringing it back again 
already as a revival. Um, and it's not the only, the, the same is true, uh, you know, I think as we look at what's going to happen with other operas that we're bringing that are going to be new in the next season, it's also to think, what will it look like in revival? It's not from the standpoint of like, oh, one and done, but because we, it, it does it to that point. It doesn't make sense to spend the money to develop it and then have it only have one opportunity. You have to really do that work to grow it. Um, and to give and, and and think about what are the stories that that are going to attract um, an audience from how do we even retell Mozart or or Wagner, um, but how do you also bring these new stories that people are are telling now? Um, tell uh, t uh, t tell us a bit. Um, about your strategy, if you feel it's working, or what would you love to do if you say, this is missing, something is incomplete, we wish we could do that, or what? I mean, we're, we're trying to do things um, in unusual spaces, like our festival's in January, and it's freezing in New York City in January, but we do outdoor performance. So we commissioned a piece for an ice skating rink, and so it happened on the ice skating rink, and some people skated, and some people watched from the outside, or we, this year we got very unlucky and it was very, very cold, so we actually made a last minute change to an indoor location. But the, the point of it is to um, ac have people have access to the work that wouldn't see it otherwise. They might never walk into an opera house or a theater or an arts center, but they're getting access to work in a, in a context and suddenly like they're like, oh, that was really interesting and that was fun and I, I, I wanna see more of that. How can I see more of that? Um, so offering these like free performances in unusual spaces is something that we've that we've done, which has a lot of complexity to it, but is also really fun. And watching people's reactions is really fun. We've done two pieces in Times Square and had people from all different walks of life, you know, experiencing it, gathering around. So that's really fun. Same question to you. What what would you love to do? What would what are you waiting for as an invitation? What would from an institution or a producing organization, if you could. What do I wanted to do? Yeah, what you couldn't do. What I couldn't do. I feel like I can do a lot of things. <laughs> she can. <Yeah. laughs> Which hasn't haven't been given to invite in a produce on a scale or, or to work. I, How would I, it look like? Uh, Uh, so are you asking what's my ambition is? Yeah, a vision where you say vision. We, we hear something is it is missing, is not represented. What would what do you think? I'm also How working with like? I'm also working with um, uh, groups of um, first generation school children um, in uh, very far away places um, in border uh, cities in 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 China, and and are using like music um, as a, uh, also looking at like a, a living heritage um, to not only um, uh, hire the local musicians to teach back their traditions because it's getting lost and it's not using that and 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 um, to use the new storytelling um, to give the 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 the, the, the kids um, the, the the power of performing arts and and also wor working with um, special schools mm -hmm. like including the blinds and autism kids. Um, so this actually to me, it, it sounds like you think it sounds like outreach, in, like outreach <laughs> program if you are running institutions. But to me, that's actually my ambition um, because I can write orchestra, I can write opera, I can write, and I, I am writing that. I am doing all this other stuff, big and small, um, and crazy shit, sorry, crazy uh, <laughs> and punk bands. Um, but but to me, like I I'm also looking at my power of of not only do I have um the the the, the platforms, but also um, what is the new music means not just to audience in New York, in Vienna, um, in in Darmstadt, in Shanghai, but really like not just regular people like. People who live very like access, right? I'm talking about knowledge access, and this is something that I feel that I would love to do more collaborations and and engaging more artists, like 
when, and 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 do like on the ground work. And this is something is is my ambition. Um, and I think that um, this is I feel like what new music can really do. You know, like new storytelling can really pushing forward um, to this tradition. And I think we, for me, I have to think bigger and I cannot and I, and I never, because I never think I'm part of the 2%. So I never wait for institutions to, to join their party. I am having my own party. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that there's a spectrum of work that can happen that can speak to different constituencies. And that's what's, and, and that for that work to exist in a common platform is really interesting. Like in this prototype that we just finished, we had 17 Ukrainians that we brought over to make this incredible work, Chernobyl Dorf, that Duyan brought that work to us. And it was this phenomenal kind of experimental theater work thro throwback to some genres of experimental theater in New York, but in a contemporary music context. And there was lots of nakedness and, uh, there was some really loud guitar and people could wear it, put their headphones in, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it was this incredible mix, this visionary kind of work. And then in the same festival, we also had um, Heather Christian's piece, Turche, which I worked on for the last five years with 36 people on stage. And it was an amateur and professional chorus. And the work was built over many months. And you had this feeling in the work of the community that was knit across that group of people that were sharing that stage and that were then sharing that with the audience that was present. And those works are existing in the same festival and they're existing in, in the same conversation. They're not different conversations because to the Ukrainian artists, the work that they're making was having this resonance to the war that's happening there now, even though they made the work before, now it has a whole new resonance to the, the community that was being engaged with Heather that was speaking to their audience at the, in the same way. So I, I just think that there's a way that you can, uh, for me, it's the passion and vision of an individual artist. And if you can bring that to light in, in their intention, that's where you're succeeding. And that's following a little on what you were just saying, Duyan. That's, that's what it is. And that's why those things can fit in the same festival because the passion and vision of those artists was really coming through because they had the right support and context for the work to be seen and experienced. I also think that, that from that standpoint too, the idea that for many times in terms of the opera form that has been in the past presented at the Met, people always thought or tried to approach it, which is why some people said, this is not for me, but from the standpoint of you're moving up some cultural ladder or some social ladder because you've gone to the opera. Like you had to aspire to that. And if we really want to capture audiences and stories, we have to inspire. Like our works need to say something and speak to people's hearts. And that's why the idea in terms of new stories, when you see, I mean, when, you know, when I saw just the number of people, I mean, I, you know, visibly, physically remember going to operas and maybe there's six people of color. To see the audience came in for Fire Shut My Bones or for, um, X, I literally was standing at one point on the grand tier and watching people um, come in and, and, and was getting a little late, but I was like, this is a sea of people of color. This is not, you know, one or two. And I want them to come back, not just for X or fire, but I want them to come back, you know, hear Angel Blue in Carmen or hear, you know, Igul or hear our next supper, El Nino, which is going to talk about stories, yes, by it is by a male composer, by John Adams, but uh, Elaine Blank uh, Cruz is going to be the, the director, um, and um, Devon Tynes and, and Julia Bullock and Janae Bridges are coming, and it's also going to tell a story that of nativity, but about immigration. I mean, these are the stories that we think will also excite um, and inspire people and not just that you come into the Met and you'll suddenly get this, you know, imprimatur of like, oh, you're now a cultured person. That, I think that also, that particular story is gone by the wayside. Organizations like yours in terms of saying, here's the way to experience these amazing creative people 
that's what we want at the Met. There are amazing creative people that are working there. And so to bring those stories out is really, when you ask like my ambition, that's, that's, that's my ambition to see that and people to see the, the range of, even how some of these stories connect that, you know, the migration story crosses many, many, many cultures and many, many different um, um, nationalities and people. The struggle for um, empowerment in terms of women crosses many, many different groups. We can see the connections if we also don't get lost in like, oh no, that was composed by Puccini or, you know, so it doesn't really, it can't really matter to me. That that's once we make those connections, I, I think our seats will be full. Should we go to audience question? We have such a great audience here, and um, and um, and and to participate, you know, this is a dialogue, as you see it, or a multi log. Um, so um, I'll come down. Any comments or um, so one, two, three, four. Okay, I'll start, yes, Jesse. Maybe shortly introduce yourself, and you have to speak in the microphone because it's also um, streamed. Hi, thank you for the conversation. Um, my name is Jess, and I'm at the Graduate Center getting a PhD, and I'm also a dramaturg. Um, and one of the things that I'm thinking, like seeing the landscape of what's on the stage, um, we have an artist, a composer, we have a producer of a new festival, we have the institutions here. And the one element that is kind of missing, but also I think such a strong part are like the collectives. Like Dion, when I think of your work, when I was first introduced with you, it was International Contemporary Ensemble. And so I'm wondering what and how the collective of composers, or the collective of composers and designers who are generating the work and who are supporting each other, how they get enmeshed within the system of uh, producing new work. I mean, we've collaborated with ICE and with Contemporaneous and with a number of the ensembles here. We often um, sometimes co-commission, like the festival will co-commission with an ensemble, a composer that we're all excited about and then work together on it. Um, We've also, at here, we've worked with companies like Bing and Y, um, which is a collective of composers. And we've also worked with the individual composers outside of their collective. So I think that there's a lot of different models of empowerment and collaboration, and that it's exciting and fun. And it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's another way to think about your players and your players being your um, creative forces, not just executing the inspirational music, yeah. 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 is, you know, made by these two composers, um, but they only work with their actors. So in a way, it's very collective uh, creating works. And I myself um, also do not like opera. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. But that's why I want to do opera, right? Because you just you, you you challenge yourself, see that what you can do to to shift that narrative and to what kind of story ooh can you tell ooh, um um. But but you, to go back to your question of of collective. Um, I do think that as a curator and as people, I'm like we we do need to be really mindful of of looking out to these um collective energies. Because that, uh, when I'm talking about the thing, because the one thing that I do not like ab about opera is that it's so hierarchical. The composer is so high up. Um, and I don't agree with that. Um, I think so many things that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a theater making is about ideas. And, and it's also about, um, and when we are also talking about engaging other music traditions, you cannot just say, oh, featuring this. I mean, there's just so much part of that creation of the work. So we also need to be very mindful of that as well. Next question, yes, what was it? And then you. Uh, 
Does this work? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Olivia. Uh, so I spent most of my professional career, that is still pretty fresh, but still <laughs> nonetheless uh, in classical music programming, also in Vienna and Berlin. Uh, I'm also a musicologist and a researcher. So, so like so many of these things resonated with me very much uh, and I'm very excited about this. So uh, bear with me. Um, I think two very formative texts for me or for formative moments, these are both by men, so I'm sorry about that, but our um, music theories, White Racial Frame by Philip Ewell, and then also um, Hungry Listening, an indigenous theory for, uh, a resonant theory for indigenous sound studies, which I'm sure you're um, familiar with. Um, and so these really got me thinking about the question of like, uh, how do we create um, validation or systems of validation and hierarchies. And so my question to you would be kind of what your stance or approaches are to, on the one hand, um, implement that in, in programming and breaking up, you were talking about breaking up these content structures and like these um, levels of like, how do we get people to feel comfortable entering a space? But then also the questions of like listening, how do we, how do we listen and what does it mean to listen when we've been educated in certain ways of tonality and how does that shape our programming practice? Sorry, that was maybe very long, but. And I do think that that's some of the challenge too, but that's also gonna be continuing the conversation for the next generation as we think about who are the composers. I mean, if anyone had the chance to come to X, the life and times of Malcolm X, I mean, you hear a whole different um, kind of tonality and yes, still within the structure because that's how you know Anthony works, but also adding the the jazz on top of what we also talk about in terms of classical. That's a very different, and I could hear for some people who were in the audience that sometimes that was also a challenge, both in terms of and and people looking, where's the melody? Where's the you know? But it didn't always have the sort of traditional. Aria moment and all and, and that, but and Terence does this. Blanchard does a little bit of the same. I, I think that this is these are the things that are going to keep keep challenging and shaping, because a lot of times it was also too about the story, the power power of the story. But and I was I have to say for for I was surprised to hear people's reaction, and I don't think it was. I mean, they don't have to be polite or nice to me. They can say whatever, but it was, they really were moved. They really were, the stories actually spoke to them as well as the music in different ways. So I think that that um, the more we push ourselves as, as organizations and institutions um, with these um, opportunities and have these conversations with different composers. I mean, the our artistic department and our, um, Ferris Arts are having, and our dramaturge are having conversations in a lot of different spaces. Um, and in and, and order for these operas also to come, we have to have collaborations but to come to the Met. It, it's, it's, there was a time maybe you could come and stage it for the first time. You know, the finances of it require, start with a place that can maybe shape it and then you re you think about how you move that or expand it. Um, and I think that that's to the point of terms of collectives, that's gonna be the way for most arts organizations and particularly large ones, because you just can't start literally at the moment of experimentation, just, just in terms of cost. So um, the more we do those kinds of collaborations and outreach, both the stronger our stories are going to be, the more it'll have a reach. You've also then built an audience because you've got people who also know some of those works to begin with. And, and that, in terms of institution, those are certain realities that you do have to acknowledge, um, um, you know, and the conversations that you have with your, your funders and things like that. So I do think that thinking about how we push ourselves, but how do we create those collaborations so we can bring those works. I would just briefly add that I think that um, people are really hungry for fresh experiences. And every year in the festival, you know, we'll bring something 
and people will come up and be like, I've never heard anything like that before. Thank you so much for giving me that experience. And I think there is a hunger and a curiosity that people have. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that people want that. I don't think they want the same. Hello? Yep. Hi, I'm Lily. I have a PhD in Milo Rao. Um, <laughs> wow, you are a such and so, <laughs> and so I'm just going to ignore him for a moment because I feel extremely inspired listening to you three amazing women talk about this and the ways in which each of you have found a way to work within or without institutional dramaturgies in an extremely exciting way. And I'm saying that as somebody who literally left North America because I didn't think the theatrical and performance institutions in North America had anything more to offer me or anything particularly interesting. I'm saying that as someone coming from Edmonton, not New York, but um, I think the point remains valid. Um, I'm just, I'm curious about a lot of things and I could talk with each of you for hours, I'm sure, <laughs> but, um, I'm always with institutional dramaturgy, which is a concept I'm looking more and more at within my work surrounding Milo and Bina Festivalchen and Entegent. Um, I think often, particularly within the really stratified institutions that you see in Europe, there's this sense that we can't um, break down the master's house using the master's tools. And yet, each of you have in your own way found a way to move into stratified institutions or create new institutions of your own that have a greater flexibility. And I'm just interested in your insights in doing that and how this has changed and how it's developed and how things have gotten perhaps better, perhaps worse, perhaps different. Um, thank you. <laughs> she, she she told him don't <laughs> i i mean one of the things i do think is important is is some aspect of thinking about what are the things within the context of those institutions that you think you want to hold on to i do think the scale and size of what's possible on the stages at a Metropolitan Opera is really quite amazing and can be quite magical. Um, but how do you, we constantly have to, how do you do that with new things? And that's why I say you have to start in some ways, see how it works in smaller spaces and then sort of figure out what that is, that translation. That's why we have such amazing gifted people within our production group, um, along with even in terms of the dramaturgy, how do you make those kinds of translations or you know the the size of the chorus the size of the you know the dancing what shifts in terms of the choreography you know also stage gets bigger how do you get you know across the stage in that and the costume how does it translate um in a in a bigger space i think the more we keep doing that work and figuring out how to do that translation, that's the way, when, when you say flexible, that's what large output companies have had to figure out. How do you do that as opposed to you being the experimental place? You might be the supportive in terms of some, some funding, encouraging, work with different, as I said, different opera companies or even, you know, maybe one day we'll look at prototype. <laughs> Peter Gelb might come get me, but because I said, but you know, you look at the 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 kind of performance that is happening in that space. What is it that might trans translate in terms of both scale, spectacle, in that way for 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 a Met? Um, I mean, I think that that's also what is exciting when you say, oh, you're um, getting these opportunities to to sort of make these shifts. It's like how far can we go? But also most importantly, it's like, how do we make sure it survives? Not just, sur you know, trickle, survive, maybe we get a thousand people a night, because that won't be possible. 
but really say there are people who want to come and see what the stories we're doing. They want to come and engage with the ideas that we are talking about. That that is absolutely motivates me every day because because it really is as I said unless somebody out there has the secret and I'd love it if you share it of the fountain of youth we just won't have that audience that always saw those same things before and to your point the a whole new generation just because of social media and streaming services and everything else do look for what is the new I mean, we, we are absolutely at a critical point. We have to figure out what is the new, not in a way that just um, um, uh, people just sort of like, oh, it's new, now it's old, throw it out. What, how do we look for the new that is gonna be sustainable? That's, I think, is, and is really critical. And also relatable as well, um, and not just the new. Um, I actually think that the most fun I had with dramaturg, dramaturg, um, is actually the revival productions. Um, because for me, you know, premiere production, I'm always like, like, rah, no, yes. There's too many fights, right, for you to really enjoy having the dramaturg. Um, that's a, kind of a joke, 50%, and you know it's 50% <laughs> absolutely true. Um, but the revival production is, 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 is so fun because you are at least you are also as a as artist you are also very at loose of of, of 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 interest in knowing how that piece before you have died um still take a different kind of shape and the fluidity of that right and especially if that work has something to do with social topic so that social topic and especially if you are um, working with institution a bit especially i mean even if the small or big major institutions, because major institutions have such a power to collaborate with other major institutions or small uh, institutions in the city, whatever that city might be. And um, uh, in a uh, uh, case in point, like you were talking about Angel's Bone, when we're doing like different Angel's Bones um, in different places, what happens is that I always wanted to work and talk with the dramaturg about the human trafficking problems in that place. Um, because as we know, that problem is not just a fixed problem. And, and if we can use institutional support and to understand what is the, that social problem is in that locale, and because of that dynamic of that, that would happen will really translate to your audience. And that power will get the audience into the conversation, not just into the door. And I think to me, that's very important. And that's, I think, is the power of working as a job in the big institutions or however institutions that you might be end up doing. Yeah, just to add on, yeah, it's relevance and resonance to our times. Like that's what we're thinking about all the time is what's relevant and resonant and how can, how can we amplify that at this moment? And then the other thing is like, follow the art. Like that's what it is. It's like, the artist is at the center of it and you're helping to craft the best work that can be made. And it's not gonna be the same the next time you're following the art because it's not the same anytime. Every, we're not making widgets, we're making something different every time, so. Hi, it's Zishan Urlu and um, I'm a performer and director. I ha actually, I have a small uh, comment about, um, I just read this sentence, it said that if the map does not agree with the ground, the map is wrong. So I'm just hearing a lot of, if the map does not agree with the ground, the map is wrong. And I am hearing so many times here, like when Peter Galp, I think is a question of uh, desire to communicate. And I don't see that yet. I don't see yet that $2 million has been spent for only six shows. Something is wrong with the map and in the ground. So I'm not going to ask question, but I think uh, we have to think, we have to change the narrative. We really have to get to on the same table, share a soup and do something. 
And Milo, you became my hero because I didn't know how to make theater the way you were doing. And I was thinking, but uh, my imagination was not enough, really not enough. After seeing Moscow trial, I was in shock, literally. I was like, what? So the way we are looking at the operas or music festivals that has to change somehow, bring a completely new mindset into it that the process changes. And as you said, uh, Dune, that I have also seen your operas and I love, it is just kind of how to we can reach the others. I mean, we are still is a little bubble, you know, yeah, we are talking about each other. I'm like, how many people are there? Are where they? are they? You know, where where are the PhD other students, high school students? Hello. And then, you know, all these things, somehow still I feel after this panel, I, I'm not satisfied. I'm just kind of feeling the map does not agree with the ground. And I am looking a really what is the ground actually? I don't know that I can we could respond necessarily it's to the comment yeah. of the with, I mean, I think part of it is to try to figure out how do you Maybe a acknowledge question. the next. The ne that's why I say you have to figure out how you acknowledge the next generation. What they, what do they want? As well as you know, when you, you and you're talking about these ideas, and you do Milo of the ideas that connect to something that's happening in real time, using art to actually engage people in ideas. I think that's been a big part of what, um quote unquote, traditional opera has learned that there is an opportunity to really reach people, again, as I said, to inspire people, but to reach people based on the ideas that are presented. But we also have to have real conversations about what those works are and not kind of just in the fantasy. We have to have those real conversations. Yeah, I mean, when as a, as a, as a director, you enter opera now from, from that door, uh, how a new opera, of course you go from, when you come from theater, from activism, from community work, and then you go into a highly uh, professionalized machine, uh, super expensive, every step, and as you said, super hierarchical, you get the, the, the script, the, the score, and then you make your concept, and then you give your concept two years before you would even stage it, and the musicians learn it, and when you arrive, the thing is done. And in the five weeks, you can stage, no, but it's, it's. I mean, we did what we could in Geneva, that we, overnight, Hector was then changing the score, and we were trying to put it in the heads of the of the 100 musicians very fast, that we have other changeovers. We in, invited uh, guitar players from Congo, they were on stage two and everything. But I remember that after the general rehearsal, we had, uh, we had the impression that the ending was wrong. So the Fiston Wanza Mujila, a very known writer from Congo, he was on stage too. He, wa he was the writer of the, of the script, uh, of, the, of the libretto, missed the word. And, uh, he, uh, and, and the end was wrong. And then we said, okay, we need another ending. And this includes another way of the orchestra to play and then like and, and the choir. And then 200 people are involved. And I remember that they said, how can we change it? So, and then I had, before the premiere, I had 10 minutes with the orchestra to change it. So it was really like from seven to seven ten, we changed the ending and at eight was the premiere. Because so many people are involved, you know? And, uh, and this, is the <laughs> this is the difficulty of collective work in the opera, because bringing together this collective is so expensive and difficult that, um, yeah, you can't just hang around with the orchestra for five weeks. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and of course, when we are talking now about this Academy Second Modernism, of course, we try to create, I don't know how you do it, but to, to spaces to hang around and to, to, to share and to find out what you want to do and to, yeah, to find spaces of time and, 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 and collective fantasy in this, in this, in this, crazy machine before you then go inside the next process of producing like crazy 
And for me, as a, as a, the, just to end it, as a director, when we did Mozart, for example, and even worse with Wagner, I mean, it's so many scenes you have to do in like some weeks that you know you see this scene once and you just say cha 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 and then ciao and you will not see it again until the premiere. And this way of working, of course, is wrong. And, uh, but it's wrong for reasons that are objectively given by, by what is possible, you know? And um, voila, so it's, it's perhaps we need other works. Perhaps we need uh, to say, okay, for 50 years we don't do Wagner and we try to develop in another way. And uh, I mean, it's very basic and structural decision that has been taken to, to change it because it's, uh, it's the opera and is a, for me a machine that is so much more fordist, you know, <laughs> like, a, like an old factory and is so much, I mean, in a very beautiful way, not non-neoliberal, you know? You can't just flexibly change this and that, and then you throw away this one, because this experience, you can't throw it away. You can't throw away this musician because you don't like him, because you need the musician, you know? You can't exchange it by a manager, because a manager can't play the violin. So it's, it's a very, it's a super nice way of, 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 of human practice, and at the same time, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult. Yeah, I mean, when you described, I, I just would imagine if you had come in in 10 minutes with the, along with our orchestra being part of its own union too. I mean, there are 15 different unions that, that we work with within the, the structure. So that's a whole other kind of sad to sorry to add the lawyer part on this, the collective bargaining <laughs> agreement that would define when that rehearsal. But we're also, I mean, for the Met and for the size that we are, we do 20 different operas within 33 weeks. You, you have to learn those operas. And the people who are performing have a certain level of, they want to perform the music well, so not doing it 10 minutes before with new music, that would be a whole, and if you're a composer, you want to hear it played well to, I mean, I mean, they're all skilled artists. Yes, they can read. But even if you, if you know, if I were a dancer and, and I've been in that space where somebody changes the steps, like just as the curtain's going up, you're like, oh, blankety blank, how am I going to now remember this new step to make sure that you do it well because you don't want to, you know, dishonor the thing. So I think there are certain aspects, not just of large opera companies, but of the construction of art, unless you're saying, ladies and gentlemen, this is a completely improv moment. You know, I mean, and that could be in its way when you say the ground, that would be a very interesting thing, hard and amazingly interesting to do with a chorus of 90, an orchestra of 90, uh, dancers, 40, 50 of them, and then the, the lead singers, along with the people running the sets and the, like, if you did that all improv, it, 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 I, 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 don't know that it's going to be happening ever at the Met, but I have to say, I would probably buy a ticket to see that show. <laughs> so, <laughs> because we, it would be, it would, it would, it would, it would challenge a whole lot of, a, a whole lot of ideas. Yeah, we, we are out of time, almost out of time, already over time. But um, before we come to the next section, maybe um, everybody could say very shortly, what are you working on for your next project? What's on your, what's baking in the oven? Um, budget. I know that we, we oh, I, I, I think it's really important to, to talk about budget um, and numbers. And I feel like we don't talk about numbers. And um, performing art is so expensive. We are so, this culture is so used to, to movies. And because movies can just get screen. And, and when we look at, when you talk about like six million for the, it's, it's, when you think about it, it's not that much. To, it's really expensive to live in New York City. Really, really expensive. So when when we like travel to Europe, for instance, they they would be like, oh, why people coming from U.S. or whatever, you know, asks this much money? You're like, oh, but people will lose money <laughs> going to places, right? Pe things like that. So so I think our machine of this performing arts or modern music or whatever the the field that we are in is expensive. And to me, I think it's worth doing it and and i am going to go back to your question of what i'm working on now uh, a lot of things but i am also looking at um 
how the ambition works with like to put it on the ground different places and 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 on different stages and that has so much to do with money and numbers and 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 how many meetings that we talk about is not just about the artist visions because we just get it right away we don't need to have a meeting about that that right but it's the numbers the moving numbers and i think that we maybe there is something really deeper here at play too that this um private funding of the american culture which is very different than in vienna and in germany and all that um, and the, the world trying to have this kind of conversation, but the money comes from different part of government and all that. So when we're talking about global exchange, we need to also talk about the exchange of the money power and, and, and all that. So just open-ended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, Frank, as you know, uh, it's written a manifesto and the col collecting ideas how to how to how to change the situation so i of course i made some notes um and um i mean i'm a i'm a big fan of of, of very simple technical rules no so for example you do you you said uh, the world premiere has to go out i mean i completely agree after my experience of four shows uh what what to do with the heritage i mean what to do with with schoenberg but for me, the biggest question is what I mean. I, I noted one sentence: uh, uh, "What what does new music mean?" I mean, what is why why most of the people is completely afraid of Schoenberg hundred years after he is dead, as and why is all these people afraid of opera and new music? Like it would be a crazy elitist bondage experience, you know? And and how can this be changed? Why modernism never landed? in our culture i mean it landed in design it landed in the way how we conceive ourselves how we i mean in everything we see here modernism landed everywhere but not in music so why not i don't know i was just like reflecting now um and then i want to end with a sentence that i featured from you oh, yeah so change is hard extinction is maybe harder <laughs> and uh, Yes, and uh, I think that's it. And uh, because, I mean, then the question for me is even if modernism never landed, why are we still giving two millions for four shows? Why do we hold it like this? What is the, what is the reason? What do we expect from modernism, you know? And, and when, will it op when will this closed flower for me still open and explain us why it exists? So why it really exists, you know? And that's that's my my last quote. Big ambition is for more people to see some of the really amazing work that we're here about to do. Best El Nino, Forza. Um, come back for those who didn't get to see the hours or fire up my bones, which I think stories that might not have been on the 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 Met stages before, or they were in other formats. I was thinking about Laba Wim and then the hours, you know, which is talking about illness and disease and, you know, no one really, uh, you know, consumption or something in Laba Wim, but the realities of what was happening in the AIDS crisis, of, you know, in the 70s and 80s here in the U.S., it, those are important stories for, for us to be um, both talking about and sharing. So um, I hope that you all will come. Um, I'm working on a new work with Kamala Shankaram, who's a frequent collaborator of mine, wonderful composer. It's called Joan of the City, and it's dealing with homelessness and gentrification. And we've collaborated with women in shelters to create the text, and it'll be performed in the streets. Well, um, thank you all. For the panel, as a last comment, you know, this afternoon we talked about your book and uh, your ideas that we have to leave the spaces, the safe spaces. And when you took over Ghent, you said, I have to be in Mosul, I have to go to Africa or go back, you did work in Iraq, you know, how would it be if the Metropolitan Opera had two million and you would go somewhere and bring something back, develop something, perform outside, perhaps for the people, 
it's paid a lot of it also by taxes by the everybody so maybe you know it, the unthinkable the breaking down of what is what we used to think of you know is something we are starting considering now especially after this devastating time of corona it happened now uh, it didn't happen 10 years ago 20 or five so something um, is up um, I would like to thank you and we maybe go right away Milo we don't even give you your coffee break uh, so but thank you for coming it means a lot to us and um, it's a great it's of course a, a, a big wide field and um, so really thank you